All right, today we're going to talk about the biblical law of change. I'm not going to say that the Bible is comparable to science. I would say rather that science is comparable to the Bible because the Bible is a scientific book. A lot of people try to reject that. The Bible talks about oppositions of science falsely so called. And things that would fall under that, of course, are global warming, evolution, things like that. But today I want to show a law of science that no real scientist would reject. And I'm going to show you that this law actually lines up perfectly with the Bible. All right. The second law of thermodynamics. I'm going to read the official Wikipedia uh, definition here. And you're going to see the typical college uh, intelligence, you know, type of thing, you know, where they, they overcomplicate it. Okay. It's a very simple definition, but they make it, they have to make it sound really big and impressive. It says here, quote, the second law of thermodynamics dynamics is an expression of the tendency that over time differences in temperature, pressure, and chemical potential equilibrate in an isolated physical system. From the state of thermodynamic equilibrium, the law deduced the principle of the increase of entropy and explains the phenomenon of, phenomena of irreversibility in nature. The second law declares the impossibility of machines that generate usable energy from the abundant internal energy of nature by processes called perpetual motion of the second kind. The second law may be expressed in many specific ways, but the first formulation is credited to the French scientist Sadi Carnot in 1824, see Timeline of Thermodynamics. The law is usually stated in physical terms of impossible processes. In classical thermodynamics, the second law is a basic postulate applicable to any system involving measurable heat transfer while in statistical thermodynamics, the second law is a consequence of unitarity in quantum theory. In classical thermodynamics, the second law defines the concept of thermodynamic entropy, while in statistic, statistical mechanics, entropy is defined from information theory known as the Shannon entropy. Wow, what a blessing. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to give you the redneck definition. All right. This is the Brian Dunninger redneck definition of how to define the second law of thermodynamics. If you park your truck in the front yard and don't run it for a while, it's going to be hard to start. It'll begin to rust and the tiles will go flat and then the weeds will grow up around it and eventually it'll end up going to the junkyard. In other words, things get worse over time, not better. All right, the law of change, the scientific law of change, the second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. Things break down over time. You know, it's kind of interesting there, the thermodynamics. You know, if you expose heat to something, it goes, it gets worse. Take, for instance, those pieces of firewood out there. Now, you get a, a really nice piece of firewood, no bug damage to it, nice split out of a nice live tree, and then it dries and seasons perfectly nice pretty piece of firewood you take it in you put it inside that wood stove does it change for the better or for the worse for that piece of firewood it gets worse doesn't it right now you can take this 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 is a known law of science because it is testable demonstrable and observable you say what are you talking about take anything and set it outside and come back in a year if it's still there it's going to be in worse condition than when you originally put it out. Okay, it's a known law of science. And that law is clearly stated in the Bible. That's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to show you that the Bible teaches the law of change. And the second law of thermodynamics is just a bunch of scientists basically saying that, you know, yeah, the Bible's right. Of course, they won't come out and say that because they don't want to, you know, if they, if they say one part of the Bible's right, then, you know, maybe other parts are too. So we're going to start out this morning in Genesis chapter 35. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. The very first book in your Bible. Now we're going to play a little game today. As we go through these different passages, we're going to see examples of change, the biblical law of change, and I'm going to ask you a question. Is it good change or bad change? So keep that in mind as we read through these passages. All right, Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, 
Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. That's the very first time in your King James Bible that the word change appears. Very first time. Right there, Genesis chapter 35, verse 2. Change your garments, it says. Verse 3. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with, with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. It's kind of interesting. They were doing the right things. They were doing what the Lord commanded them to do. And because of that, the people, the pagan, heathen nations, they wouldn't mess with them because they saw it was a God-fearing people and that God was with them. Very interesting there. But uh, notice there in verse 2, the, the first reference to the word change. What was it that they were supposed to change? Their garments. Did you know that that's going to happen to you if you get saved? Especially if you're a woman. The Bible has a lot more instruction for women in that area. Women are to, to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. That whole thing. We have a whole message on modest apparel for women. You don't see a woman getting saved and continuing to wear mini skirts or skin tight pants or low cut tops or things. You know, something should change there. All right. Now this, you know, doctrinally you have here back in the Old Testament. Yeah, sure. But instruction and in righteousness, it's there. Okay. The Bible does teach modest apparel for a woman. You know, there's an old saying, your, cl your clothes say it for you. And that's true. I mean, that's an absolute truth. I mean, if you're out in public and you see some guy walking along with camouflage on or something, you say, okay, well, depending on the type of camouflage, either he's a hunter or he's in the military. That's not a bad thing. You know, that's not, you know, prejudice or anything like that. It's, it's right there. You know, you see some guy wearing... Uh, jeans with black leather chaps and a black leather vest and a Harley Davidson t-shirt we look for his motorcycle yeah and what do you think when you see some woman wearing barely, barely any clothes interesting Proverbs chapter 7 verse 10 says and behold there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart did you know that there's an attire of a harlot <laughs> you know you go to a place like Las Vegas where prostitution is legal You'll see women that are dressed specifically to advertise. It's kind of interesting. I remember the one time I uh, used to go to church in Ephrata there, and I was coming home. I went past this Dove Church thing, and there was a woman standing out in the parking lot, and it was like I, I had to take a double take. She was wearing immodest clothing, just ridiculous, skin-tight stuff, and it was flesh-collared. I mean, I literally, I drove by and I thought I thought she was standing there with nothing on. That's how bad it was. It was skin tight and skin collared. What was she trying to do? You tell me, and, and she came out of the church. You know? I mean, come on. What's she trying to attract? I mean, it, it was bad enough that she was supposedly a Christian, you know? But the fact is, she's just walked out of this church service like that. And I can tell you, she could have walked out to Las Vegas to any street corner and fit right in with those prostitutes. I can tell you that. What was wrong? She didn't make the change yet. Okay? She wasn't redeemed. Don't tell me a woman like that is redeemed. I don't believe it. Not for a second. So let me ask you a question. Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Is that a good change or a bad change? Good. Good. <laughs> That's a good change. Now we're going, to, we're going to go to the next one. And there's a lot of changes mentioned in the Bible, but we're just going to hit a couple today. Psalm 102. Turn towards the back of your Bible. <clears throat> this is the biggest book in your Bible. Psalm 102, verse 25. We're going to see another change here. Something that's going to happen in the future. 
And this is a very interesting one. Okay, it says here, Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Now let me ask you a question. Is that good change or bad change? It's kind of a trick question. It's both, actually. It's going to be bad what happens in the tribulation, and specifically so. I think that this is really a reference to even after the millennium. That whole thing, it begins with the tribulation, then it goes through to the end of the millennium when the earth is dissolved and the elements melt, melt with fervent heat. It's going to be bad in, in a way, but then the Lord makes new heavens and a new earth. You know, it says that he'll change them as a garment. Uh, so it's actually going to be good. So it's a little bit of both. That's kind of a trick one there. But uh, we had our hymn this morning, uh, number 440 in our hymnal, Abide with me, and the second verse says, Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's, earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Now here's where it's interesting. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. Of course, the song there is Abide with me if I didn't mention that. But uh, <clears throat> a lot of those old hymns are based on Scripture. And that hymn right there, it, or that, that line in that hymn, is based on this portion right here in Psalms. The earth is going to change, but God doesn't. That's very interesting. God does not change. And that should kind of tell you some things about what the Bible thinks about change, things changing. You know, you don't have to worry about God changing the plan of salvation. Salvation is not going to change as far as right now. It's not like, well, you know, people were saved by believing in Jesus Christ, you know, a year ago, but now today, we, you know, God kind of changed it and updated it. And I, while I'm on the subject, you don't have to worry about God continually re-inspiring the Bible. <laughs> okay? The, the Lord will put His Word into a language and then He says, keep it, preserve it. You, all through Scripture you see this thing of change. Don't change the Bible. Don't change what I've given you. Preserve it. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. God's Word gets pure over time. When you see it getting worse and worse and worse, you're not dealing with God's Word. Talk more about that in just a few minutes here. Now we're going to go next to Proverbs chapter 24. A lot of people say, oh, this old King James Bible, it's not relevant for today. We're going to see about that. Proverbs chapter 24, we're going to go to verse 19. Now when we had Obama coming into office... What was his big slogan? Hope and change. All right? Let's look about that. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 19. It says here, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil man, the candle of the wicked shall be put out. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Hmm. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. He that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse, nations shall abhor him. But to them that rebuke him shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon them. When you start to give in to change, which is what's going on there, you say, what about this thing of, you know, meddle not with them that are given to change? Well, our English language kind of, you can sound that thing out, split the word in half. Given could be said as give in to change. In other words, change is going to happen. Okay, second law of thermodynamics. It's going to get worse. But if you say, I think that these, these changes that are worse, you say, well, I think that that's a good thing. And I think it's getting better. Well, then you are giving in to the change. And the Bible says you're not to meddle with people like that. Don't mess with them. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to get hit more on this a little bit later. If you talk to a modern worldly Christian and they're saying, I, th oh, I think things are getting better. I think that the economy is going to get better. I think that, you know, Obama's really going to make a 
positive change here in America, and I think things are going to get wonderful, don't mess with them. Don't fellowship with people like that. Why? Because they don't. They're very ignorant of Scripture. They're very ignorant of the proof of history. All right, things are not going to get better. Don't meddle with people like that. And you should be one that rebukes things, you know, situations like that. But now, let's play the game again. The change here. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Is it good change or bad change? Bad change. All right. And uh, I'll ask another question. Did Obama, did Obama bring change? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what kind of change? Bad change. So you can say, you know, somebody can say, I, I'm going to change things in America. Well, he, he did. You know, it's just been bad. <laughs> so he, you know, that's one area where he actually told the truth. You know, <laughs> Hope for the globalists and, and change for the globalists, you know, for their cause. That's what Obama brought. He just didn't bring hope and change for the American people. Um, <clears throat> little important concept here. I'm not going to, we're not going to turn to it, but Acts chapter 17 verses 21 and 22, Paul is there with these pagan Gentile people. And, uh, it says here, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Isn't that interesting? They spent their time in, in nothing else but to hear or tell some new thing. You know, that's a, a sickness right now in America. People thinking that everything has to be changed. We just got to change it all. And, you know, as the economy's falling apart and people are losing their jobs and people aren't spending money. You have big businesses saying, let's just change everything. A local grocery store here for years and years and years. And it's Mennonite owned, you know, conservative Mennonite owned, uh, was Dutch way or whatever up in Schaeferstown for years and years and years. It was the same layout. Well, no, but now they had to change it. You go into everything's restructured and reorganized and people are mad about it. People are going in there and they know what they need and they go in and, wait a second, the milk aisle used to be here and the, uh, you know, dairy products and there used to be the frozen foods and there over there was the breads and now it's, where do you go? You know, why did they feel a need to change it? You know, and even products. I get irritated with that. You know, you go in and you say, I need ketchup and there's like 16 different kinds of ketchup or something, different collars, different flavors, different, why? <laughs> you know? I'm kind of weird that way, I guess. I don't, I'm don't. i not too much into change. But uh, <clears throat> that's one thing I like. You know, I have a friend that has a cabin up north, and you go up there, that area doesn't change. <laughs> you know, they don't have much money. So, you know, you, you go to that area, it looks the same as when I went there when I was a kid. You know, but this area here, Lancaster County, it's changing all the time. Always building something and improving, you know. Now, there's a restaurant... Uh, not too far from here, <clears throat> Hershey Farms, down closer to where I grew up, and they just spent, uh, well, like a year or two ago, they spent $3 million renovating their restaurant. Why would you do that when the economy's getting worse? And there was nothing wrong with their restaurant. Nothing at all. But you see, people, they start doing that thing. We have to change. We have to make it new. We have to, what's new, 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 new. But uh, what about this thing of our modern corrupt world? Has this condition existed before? Now, I made reference to this in another sermon, but the book of Jeremiah, it's, it's wild when you read that book to see the parallels between ancient Israel, what they were going through before they collapsed, and what America is going through right now. And, you know, other countries too, like the UK and Australia as well. You know, all the quote-unquote first world nations are going through the same process. Jeremiah chapter 6, we'll go there next. We're going to see a little bit more change here and, and what the solution for change is. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10 is where we're going to start out. <clears throat> and again, here we have instruction in righteousness. 
you know, you have reproof, correction. Uh, the purpose of Scripture is first for doctrine, secondly for reproof, third for correction, fourth for instruction in righteousness. So that's why we're back here in the Old Testament. You can learn a lot. <clears throat> Things are written in aforetime, are written for our learning, Paul said. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10. All right, it says here, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Now, isn't that interesting? How many people are like that today? They their ears are they close their ears, they don't want to hear, they don't want to hearken. Behold the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They say, I'd like to talk to you about salvation. Don't talk to me about that. I'm offering you eternal life here. I'm offering you a place in heaven, God being with you, you being one of his children, I'm offering you something good, but yet to them it's a reproach. And what do they say? What's the famous thing? Don't judge me. And we were talking about that Thursday night. Yeah. Oh, you're judging me. Well, yeah, in a sense, but it's it's for your good. I'm trying to help you out here. Trying to lead you to the Lord. But they don't want to hear about it. Look at verse 11. And you see there, again, let me just say this before we continue. Verse 10, God's coming to them and saying, I want to show you the truth. And then they reject it, and here's what happens. Verse 11. Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord, I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. Now let me ask you a question. How should a Christian feel towards the Christ-rejecting world? That you witness to him and you witness to him and you witness to him and they say, get that stuff out of my face, don't talk to me about it, and they start mocking the Lord. How should you feel? Well, how do you think the Lord feels right now? towards this world do you think god's up there smiling and oh, i'm just so happy with the way the world's going right now you want to know how the lord fears feels about this world go back and read genesis chapter 6 where it says he was actually grieved that he even made man i think he's probably pretty close to that right now and i think the only thing that's really stopping him from totally being that way is the fact that there are still christians here on this earth but for not not for much longer but you see the whole thing there. God's judgment comes because these people reject the Lord. Look at verse 12. And here's what happens. Uh, after God's wrath comes, then his judgment comes. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. Isn't it interesting that a lot of Americans that were formerly very prosperous back when this nation was a lot more kind to Christians in the Bible. Those same Americans now have lost their homes. The foreclosures are just going through the roof. I mean, it's just all over the place. You know, a lot of, around here you see auctions going up for, you know, like crazy. An auction is, the bank will usually, if a home is going to be foreclosed, they'll try to auction it off first. And then if it, that doesn't work, then they foreclose it. Not every case. There are some auctions, of course, which are the people they're trying to sell it that way. But a lot of times when you're seeing these auction signs going up, it's actually a foreclosure. What's going on? Well, this verse here is specifically talking about sort of a, a military coming in and taking their houses by force, which, of course, that could eventually happen too in America. But the Lord, I think, as a judgment, is allowing America to fall apart economically. It's just going to keep getting worse. Verse 13, and again, why does God bring this judgment? Verse 13, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. That's instructive. How many preachers out there can you, can you really trust? Not too many. How many of them can you really say are going to do good with money that you give them? <laughs> not too many of them we got preachers in this country that are making a hundred plus thousand dollars and i'm talking not big mega churches i'm talking regular churches you got preachers that are making a hundred plus thousand dollars a year 
and people going there that are unemployed and the preachers just keep pumping them for money. It's incredible. It's not of the Lord. But uh, look at verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. <laughs> things are getting bad. Things are falling apart. And they're going, It's peaceful. We're in a wonderful time. Things are going to come about. You know, cracked me up. They had the, uh, a couple years ago there, Obama declared that we had a summer of recovery and that we're out of the recession. It's like, Yeah, come on. <laughs> You know, you guys are propping the whole system up with your phony printed Federal Reserve notes. I mean, give me a break. You know, we have instead of the food lines of the Great Depression, we have food stamps now. Thirty five plus million Americans on food stamps. We're in the second Great Depression. The only reason it's not really horrible yet is because we have all this phony money, which they didn't have back then as, as they had it. But it was still redeemable in gold and silver. And then towards the end of the Depression, gold became illegal to own, you know, with uh, FDR's New Deal, the communist that he was. But we'll continue. Verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush, neither shall they fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Isn't that incredible? How is that comparable to today? You get these people that live in sin, they're not at all ashamed. They do things that the Bible condemns, the Bible calls abomination. They, they don't even care. It's like, hey, that's wicked what you're doing. Eh, whatever. You know, they'll go out in public and do it. You know, it used to be, you know, the, the thing for sodomites is they said they come out of the closet. What's that imply? It implies that they did it in hiding in the past. They were afraid to show their lifestyle. They're not anymore. They're not ashamed of their abominations. Not at all. People wear things, you know. I mean, I, I, I was at the Green Dragon the one time, the, our local farm market here, and this, this guy was walking around with the F word. You know, I mean, it was like the letters were like a foot high on his T-shirt. And I'm thinking, you just walk around in public like that? No shame. None. That's what's going on. Just like it was back there in Jeremiah's day. Now what's the solution to all this? Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Isn't that interesting? But what's the reaction of the people? They say, oh, yeah, things are really bad right now. We have departed from the Lord. We're going to go back and we're going to... We'll listen to the old ways. Is that what they say? No. Finish the verse. But they said, we will not walk therein. I don't want to hear about now. Whatever. Things are getting better. See? See, the second law of thermodynamics is being applied right here. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And the people are saying, I reject known laws of science and the law of change in the Bible. I reject it. I think things are getting better. Yeah, but look, there's more There's more crime. There's more, you know, the economy's falling apart. There's more of this. I don't want to hear about it. You know, we got to go back. We got to go back to the way it used to be. No, no. We're moving forward, you know. Things were, we're coming out of the recession. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> just going to give you a quick little list here uh, just to give you some more confirmation that the Bible is scientific. The Bible says to go back to the old Paths, where's the good way? I'm going to give you a couple little things here where people, discerning people, are starting to return to the old ways. How about, how about organic food versus the other stuff? GMO, fertilized, you know, all that other, I mean, the toxic stuff that's out there. Irradiated, you know, they, they run it through radiation stuff and all that, and you eat it, you know, and genetically modified foods and all this stuff versus organic. Now, what's the funny thing about that? Go back a hundred years ago, and you and you go up to a farm stand, and you say, "Is this all certified organic?" They'd be like, "Huh? What do you mean certified organic?" Well, do you grow without all the pesticides and herbicides and you know all this chemicals? They'd be like, "Well, yeah, <laughs> we've been doing it this way for thousands of years. What are you talking about? This is only a modern thing, you know this this junk food that we eat now." 
How about glass containers versus plastic? There's a big thing about that. Bisphenol A, if you want to study that issue. Go to a store and you'll now see plastic containers that say BPA free. What is bisphenol A? It's a female, it's a synthetic female hormone. Very, very, very bad. Can give you cancer and make, if you're a man, and make you more effeminate. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. You know, you don't need sissy men walking around. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's there. It's becoming a very popular movement now. But you'll still get people that are just like, ah, oh, whatever, I don't care. You know, I'll just take it. And something else that you have to worry about or watch for, you, you know, you shouldn't worry about things as a Christian, but canned foods. Canned foods have a, a plastic lining in them, and that stuff is filled with BPA. Now, it's not going to kill you the first time you take it as long as you're pouring it out of the can and heating it there. But you get some of these guys that go out camping or whatever, and they put that canned food into the fire and then eat right out of it, you're eating the plastic along with the food. And that toxic chemical is going right into you. Really, really bad idea. BPA is mostly released when you heat the plastic. Don't put plastic things into the microwave to heat up food. All right. Another good example, we used to have a, uh, a like a, what do you call those things, a thermos that was plastic. And you drink hot tea out of the thing and you could taste the plastic. And if you can taste the plastic, you're drinking the plastic, okay? Now, a lot of people are, are looking, actually going out and looking for glass containers. Okay, it's becoming a big thing. People are seeking the old paths, the way people used to keep things in crocks and, and glass containers and even the old stainless steel milk uh, jugs or whatever things there. People are going back, you know, discerning people. A lot of people don't care, but discerning people are going back to that stuff. And while we're on the subject of milk, how about raw milk versus pasteurized? Oh, I'm bringing up contraband now. You know, in most states, raw milk is considered the same as cocaine. You will get raided by the federal forces, the FDA or, you know, maybe even the FBI or whatever, if you are selling raw milk to people. Even some states, if you are drinking raw milk from your own cow, you can get in trouble. Isn't that insane? And they say, oh, it's, 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 you know, it's dangerous. You, you're not allowed to, you know, endanger your own life. You know, it, it's ridiculous. But again, discerning people are saying, I don't want that pasteurized junk that comes from the factory. You send real milk to a factory and then you destroy it and then I'm supposed to drink it, you know. And a lot of people are saying, no, I'm going to go back to the old pads. How about electric versus non-electric? This is a big issue for me because a lot of my tools out there in my wood shop are non-electric tools. And I remember we were at this church presentation one time and they were using draw knives to peel bark off of logs. And uh, it's just basically two bent handles and then there's a blade in between you and you pull it towards you and it peels bark off. And this, this guy, like, I don't know what he did for a living. He looked like an office worker or whatever. Fine. And he said, it was nice to be able to use primitive technology. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> excuse me, your primitive technology is what I use every day. <laughs> you know, at the time I was more into woodworking. Just kind of cracked me up, you know, like it's some kind of caveman technology or something. It's like, no. A lot of those old hand tools, there's nothing, no, no machine that can do better than that. You know, they produce a totally different result. And, you know, I, I remember I read a book that one time, and, the, and this guy was saying about how that non-electric tools are better for your health because they don't kick up as much dust as electric tools do. They don't make the sound that electric tools do, so you aren't going to lose your hearing. Not only that, but when you're using a saw and you're going like this to get through the board, mo moving your arm back and forth, you're getting exercise. Just holding a regular saw and going through it, you don't get exercise. Now, you know, if you're in business and stuff, you know, I mean, if you're, you know, doing construction type stuff for a living, well, you know, hand tools are a little bit slower. You, know, you have to do things that are quick and efficient to keep your price reasonable and stuff. But my point is, electrical things, electrical appliances, and of course there's, you know, non-electric meat grinders, non-electric grain mills, and 
But there, there's a lot of non-electric things that you can get that are better for your health. Okay, and a lot of people there, again, they're saying, I'm going to return to the old pads. And it's kind of funny because you can have all the most high technology electrical appliances and the power goes out and they're all useless. And I talked about this before, but there are electromagnetic pulse weapons that if they could go off, boom, it fries the whole electrical grid. All your electrical appliances are useless. You know, I got five chainsaws right now, uh, three gas and two electric. Well, guess what happens if, if there's some kind of a solar flare or some kind of thing that blows out all the electric? Well, the little electronic ignitions and, and well, little things in there, it's going to be fried. And a chainsaw that's out of gas or that doesn't run or it's not plugged in like my electric ones, it's useless. You can't cut anything with that. Use it as a boat anchor maybe, but, you know, that's about all it'd be good for. You know, a lawn ornament or something. <clears throat> But fortunately, I have some old crosscut saws out there, too, in my shop. Take a long time to do firewood that way. But continuing here, I could go off on that all day. How about brain power versus computers? Hmm, how about that one? How many people today don't need to use their brains because their computer is their brain? Yeah, and, it's, and you know, it's I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't use computers. Again... I rely on computers on a daily basis. You know, they can do a lot of good things. But when you when you no longer can add things by hand and you no longer can spell things because, you know, you go to write something by hand and it's like, oh, I spelled that wrong. How come it didn't underline it in red, you know? <laughs> You're so used to spell check. And how about people that the text and stuff? You know, you start to spell out a word with texting and it gives you, it drops down a little list of what words and you just pick the one you want and right over. And then the texting language, you know, like I, I said this in other sermons, first time I saw LOL, I, I, it took me a while to figure out what that meant. You know, somebody said something funny and then they said LOL and I'm like, does that mean like a lol in their, in their, what they were being serious about? I didn't know what LOL meant. Laugh out loud. But instead of, of writing, you know, boy, that really made me laugh. You just go LOL, you know, and a lot of the texting language, you're actually diminishing your vocabulary. And guess what happens when you diminish your vocabulary? And this is, an, again, scientific results. You can look this up on the Internet. There have been scientific studies to prove what I'm about to say. You, you drop your vocabulary down, your IQ actually drops. Your intelligence is actually dependent on how much vocabulary you use. And you go back to the 1800s, excuse me, pick up a book sometime from the 1800s, the vocabulary that they used was incredible back then. Those people were very, very intelligent. And that's one of the reasons people don't, don't like this King James Bible. You know, oh, it's too difficult to understand. You know, it, it'll use two or three words to, to mean the same thing or whatever. Yeah, uh-huh. Read this King James Bible and actually increase your vocabulary. What about walking versus transportation? Again, I'm not condemning vehicles, but I think that we've lost a lot of things now that we drive everywhere. You know, it's kind of funny. I've read a book, or I used to subscribe to a, a sawmill magazine, and this guy laughed about how that his neighbor, he was a farmer and also ran a sawmill, and he said about how his neighbor would always be like, oh, you know, trying to talk him into going and joining the, the local gym. And he's like, I'm not going to join a gym. Well, you got to get exercise. He's like, what do you think I do outside every day? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I work on a farm and I run a sawmill. I get exercise. You know, and these people, it's kind of funny, they get in their vehicle and drive a couple miles down the road to the gym, and then they go in there and they pay to work to get on a machine to walk. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like... Here's a thought. Leave your car parked in the lane. Walk to the gym a couple miles. Turn around and walk home. You get the same amount of exercise and you didn't spend any money. You know? <laughs> Say, well, that'd be returning to an old way of doing things. Yeah, pretty much so. It's kind of funny. I'll tell you a little story here quick before we continue. One time we were at my um, younger sister and her husband's house. And their daughter came out. She's seven years old. And I had the door to my pickup truck open. 
And she went over to the, the window crank, you know, the window crank handle, and she goes, what's that? You know, she never saw a manual window crank. She's used to electric, you know, putting the thing up or down, pushing the window. And I said, well, that makes the window go up and down. Really? <laughs> you know? And she started playing with it. Wow, you know, that's so neat. <laughs> but see, even something as simple as that, it's too much to reach down and go like this and crank the window up and down. You know, ee, 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 make the thing go up and down. And you have electric buttons to make your seat go forward and back. Is it a sin to have that stuff? No. No, it's not a sin. But again, you're losing just that little bit of exercise, a little bit of effort there. Something else to think about. How about the old King James Bible versus the new perversions? You know, the new versions that came out since 1881. And it's funny because each time that they're coming out with new ones, they they often name them new, 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 new. Which is really kind of weird because after a couple of years, it's not new anymore. You know, and yet they still call it new. So what do they have to do? Well, they have to come out with another new, you know, a newer new version. It's ridiculous. And what did the Bible say about those people that uh, the Athenians spent their time in nothing else but to hear or tell some new thing? That's what the modern churches do. Oh, we have the newest Bible, the newest NIV is coming out that's going to be more accurate than the original NIV. And the new, we're going to come out with a newer one and the new, new, new. See? Don't mess with those. Uh, and it's interesting, too. I'll say this yet. You can read books from the 1700s and 1800s. Christian books, and it's neat to be actually to able to actually see them quoting the same scriptures that I hold in my hands today, and read. That's a blessing, you know. I have a connection to those Christians back to three hundred years ago. I like that. It's good to be able to do that. And finally, how about old hymns versus contemporary Christian music? It's kind of interesting there because it's like the world they come to the church for something different and the church says we're going to give you the world we'll give you the world's sound we'll give you the world's look why <laughs> they're coming out of the world so that's the problem with the modern churches are they're filled with worldly lost people a lot of times uh, but anyhow i could keep going off on that too but we'll continue here um, <clears throat> now we're going to see here this is a very interesting thing Look at uh, verse 17 there in Jeremiah chapter 6. We saw there in verse 16, they said, We will not walk therein. And so it continues. Verse 17. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. They won't walk in the old paths, and they will not listen for the sound of the trumpet. Now that is very, very, very interesting and very instructive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 53 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's that word again. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Isn't it interesting that a lot of us, I know here today, at Bible Believers Fellowship, a lot of the people that are listening, a lot of our online members, we are watchmen. And you know a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, the conspiracy angle to things, and you try to tell your friends and your relatives, and you say, all this stuff was prophesied, it's coming to pass, it's getting worse and worse, things are changing for the worse. We should be listening for the trumpet. It's mentioned right there, the rapture. And they go, what do they say? Back to Jeremiah, we will not hearken. Isn't that interesting? Duh, well, yeah, whatever. You know, people have been saying that for years. I mean, I've had relatives laugh at me. I've had people laugh at me. I say about the rapture coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, what's going on? They won't hearken. We are watchmen. We see bad things in the world and we try to warn people. You know what a watchman was? He stood up in the towers around the, the walled city and he looked out to see if the enemy was coming. And all of a sudden he sees the smoke cloud over there from a big army coming in. And he says, Warning, there's an army coming. They're coming. It's, it looks, they're coming from the direction of Babylon. It's probably the Babylonian Empire. And people down in the city go, Whatever. You're ruining my day. 
you know, doom and gloomer, you know. <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. And see, back then, the trumpet sound would have been a call to battle. Kind of like an alarm, you know. And they say, you know, here comes the trumpet blowing, and they're like, oh, man, you know, I don't want to hear that. That's negative, you know. <laughs> Same thing we have today. But uh, we read there about, we're not going to go there again here in a later study, but we read about this change that's going to happen at the rapture. Now let me ask you a question. Is that a good change or bad change? Good. Very, very, very good. We're going to hit on that in just a little bit. Now look at verse 18 and 19. To finish up here, it says, Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O, hear, o earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Isn't that interesting? And notice it doesn't say, I will allow evil, or I, I won't be able to stop the evil. God says, I will bring evil upon this people. Why? Because they rejected his words. Guess what's going to come to America? It's not going to be good change. It's going to be bad change. And right now, <clears throat> the ship that we are on, the American ship, is sinking. Kind of brings to mind this thing over there in Italy not too long ago. This big cruise ship, you know, hit this reef or whatever and it was sinking, canting to the side and the captain comes on and he's like, there's no problem, everything's all right, you know, and says, don't worry about it, just stay in your cabins, everything will be fine. You know, and a couple minutes later, you know, he's in a lifeboat, heading to shore, you know, <laughs> abandoned ship. Well, you see that here in America. The government and the media is telling you everything's all right, everything's okay, as America's going, falling to the side. And you have a lot of celebrities that are leaving the country. <laughs> Why? The ship is sinking. So what are we going to do? Well, there's a lifeboat. Okay. Mm -hmm. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you're in him, you're going to go. I can't guarantee you that, that we're not going to get, you know, a little bit wet from the boat going over, so to speak. You know, we could go through some rough stuff. But before God's wrath comes, before God's judgment comes, we are going to be leaving. And there's still some room in that lifeboat. All right. There's still some people that can get saved. We just had a, a recent convert here at this ministry. You know, praise the Lord. You can still get saved. It's not over yet. But time's running out. Now just a couple more places here and then we'll be finished this morning. Daniel chapter 7. Turn towards the back of your Bible. A couple books. You have Jeremiah. And then you have... Uh, always get that mixed up. Lamentations comes after Jeremiah. And then Ezekiel. And then you have Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. And here's some very interesting things. <clears throat> the book of Daniel is a book that was uh, basically a companion to the book of Revelation. And at the end of the book of Daniel, God tells Daniel to seal up those things until the time of the end. Basically, they aren't, they aren't going to make sense to you. This stuff's way out in the future. But this stuff will make sense to people in the end times. Excuse me. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 refers to things that are written by the prophet Daniel. So Jesus refers back to this book. But now look here. <coughs> we have the Antichrist, the description of the Antichrist here in Daniel chapter 7 verse 24. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Satan actually gives him power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. Oh, am I reading chapter 8? Oh, boy. Why do I do that? Uh, go back to chapter 7. <laughs> All right. Well, that stuff's true over there too, you know. Um, Daniel chapter 7 verse 24. I gotta quit looking up at the chapter heading things. Daniel chapter 7 verse 24. 7 24. I do mean 7 24. 
Man, I'll tell you what. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So you have there for three and a half years... See, how do you get three and a half years? A time, that's one, times is two, and the dividing of time is a half. So you get three and a half years. The Antichrist will rule for seven, but for three and a half years, he's going to get away with his devilment. And people are going to say, oh, it's, it's you know, the Christ has returned and stuff like this. And he's unified all the religions, and, you know, we have our new world order now, and it's wonderful and great and happy. You know, that's what most people are going to think. And he's going out there and he's, you know, as we read over in Daniel chapter 8, <laughs> I wasn't planning to go there, but as we read over there, he's going to go out and prosper. All right? But one of the things that the Antichrist is going to do, this guy is going to be such an egomaniac. He is actually going to change times and laws. Isn't that interesting? And I've heard talk of this. There are different scientists I've heard it say, maybe we should go with... Uh, you know, a seven-day work week, and then we'll have a, a day off at some other point in time. Or maybe we should change the seasons. Maybe we should change the hours. Maybe we should change. And the Antichrist is going to come in, and he's actually going to say, I'm going to say we're going to change the days of the week, and we're going to change this. We're going to change known laws of science. He's actually going to do that. And the Lord's going to let him get away with it for three and a half years. And then his wrath, God's wrath is really going to kick into high gear. But you see that there. Now let me ask you the question. Is a good change or bad change that the Antichrist is going to bring? Bad. Like Obama, and Obama is not the Antichrist, by the way. I think he's a precursor of the Antichrist. But like Obama, Obama came in and he said, I'm going to bring change. And he was right. He did bring change. But it was bad change. The Antichrist is going to bring change, but it's going to be bad change. Now we'll hit a couple of verses here in the New Testament and then we will be finished. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hopefully I have this reference right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. <clears throat> See, I can make excuses because I'm, I'm supposed to be a, a pastor here, a Christian pastor in the things that Paul wrote to the Gentiles, you know, to us as Christians, you know, that's where I'm supposed to know my way around. No, I'm just, <laughs> I, I shouldn't have messed up Baron Daniel, but, oh well, another proof again that I'm not perfect. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, this is one of the most important verses in your New Testament. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Good change or bad change? Good. good. That's a good change. See, oh, you, you know, I don't want to be a Christian because I'm going to have to clean up my life. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to have to live as a Christian. Okay, the Lord specifically warns about certain types of sins because they're negative for your health. You know, I mean, there have been many, many stories of, of the old time Methodist evangelist, uh, Sam Jones. He would get so drunk that he'd pass out on the floor of the bar. And they'd drag him out into the street at night. And he'd lay there all night in the street. And it'd snow on him and rain on him and stuff like that. In the morning, he'd get back up and walk back into the bar. He was just a, a really bad alcoholic. And what happened when he got saved? He became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm an evangelist now and I'm going around preaching at places and when I'm not preaching, I go and get, you know, drunk out of my mind at the bar again. Huh. He changed. Things changed. And, and you know, something else too, if you've had a rough life in the past, I know many people have, many people out there listening, when you get saved, that old life that you had is now under the blood. It's all forgiven. You can live a new life in Christ Jesus. You don't have to say, well, the Lord's going to, you know, He's just going to destroy me now because I lived in sin in the past. You know, well, 
in some ways, yeah, that some of that stuff might carry over. If you destroyed your health, well, you're going to have health problems. But the Lord has forgiven those sins. Don't dwell on them. But it is a condition there, the word if. I've talked about that before. If somebody says, I'm a Christian, and they don't live any differently than they did before their quote-unquote conversion, you're dealing with a false convert. you got to watch out for that. Now we're going to go to the last place here, Philippians chapter 3. Again, t turn towards the back of your Bible. You'll hit Galatians and then Ephesians. And then you'll hit Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. So why do you pick these these old time guys? A lot of times you talk about D. L. Moody and talk about Sam Jones and a lot of these old time preachers. Well, the reason is right here in this passage, Philippians chapter three verse seventeen. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. There are great Christians in the past that you can learn a lot from, and you should mark them. You should mark their lives and look at their lives and say, hey, if they were able to do that, I bet I could too. You're not following them in the sense of worshiping them like you would worship Jesus Christ, but you're following their example. They walk the path before you. They, they lived a victorious Christian life and showed you how to do it. Follow that life. All right. Worship Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus. But look at the example of, of Christians that have come before you. You can learn a lot from them. Verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now verse 19 there, I want to focus on that for a minute. If you remember back in Jeremiah chapter 6, we read a couple things there. And Paul actually, I, don't, I can't say he's specifically referring to Jeremiah chapter 6, but he's describing the same things. A corrupt society goes through, and he describes four things there. And we read about those back in Jeremiah chapter 6. Look at the first one. Whose end is destruction. Jeremiah 6.12 And their houses shall be turned unto others, and with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. Whose end is destruction. Right there. What's the end of America going to be? Destruction. What about the next one? Whose God is their belly. Jeremiah 6.13 For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Isn't that interesting? Whose God is their belly. They don't think about doing things for other people. They think about satisfying their own flesh. That's what's going on there. And what is that? Well, covetousness is what's going on. What about the next one? Whose glory is in their shame. Jeremiah 6.15 Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Their glory is in their shame. There are people out there that are sinning, and they actually glory about it how many college kids like to brag about how much binge drinking they do about how much fornication that they are involved in how many of them are like that you know and i saw recently here you know i i used to have it set that i could get on the internet and check my email without it going to the main page because the main page is covered with this celebrity gossip stuff and then they changed the system around and i can't get into my email thing without seeing the main page so I get to be vexed every day <laughs> that I get on the internet. But they had this one Hollywood harlot, you know, this one Hollywood star, and they said that she used to be a, a lesbian. And she said, I have no reason to hide it, you know. It was kind of a cool thing I did in my past. What's going on? She's not ashamed of it. These people out in Hollywood, they're not ashamed. They're not ashamed of the of the sins that they commit and put in front of the people. They're not ashamed of it. We'll look at the fourth one here. Who mind earthly things. Just a one final reminder here. Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they, will, they said, we will not walk therein. 
Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. So you see it there again. People today, you know what the reason is to reject this book? And to reject the, the truth of what's really going on in our world? If you mind earthly things. If you're thinking about your career, and you're thinking about your relationships, and you're thinking about your house, and you're thinking about your car, and you're thinking about your bank account, that's minding earthly things and rejecting Scripture. You say, well, then it's a sin to have those things. I didn't say that. I just simply said, if that is taking precedence over truth, if you are rejecting truth because you can't accept it because it's negative, then you are minding earthly things. You are part of the list there. You ought not to be that way as a Christian. And as I said earlier, don't be deceived by these modern Christians you get around and they don't want to talk about anything negative and they think things are getting better. You can be nice to them. You don't have to be nasty to them or anything. But don't let them talk to you and start working on you. I'm going to be real straight with you. There are times when you will hear this negative stuff and part of you is going to say, well, I wish there was some way I could disprove this. I wish there was some way that, you know, say it ain't so. You know, I wish we could have Ron Paul elected and have the Constitution restored and real money brought back and jobs brought back to America and our troops pulled out of these stupid wars that they're in and go back to peaceful times. Part of me wishes that that could happen. But then I have to look at the Bible and I have to say, what does the Bible say? The Bible says it's not going to happen like that. The Bible teaches the law of change. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. Like the song says. Look at verse 20 here in uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's what you should be like as a Christian. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That should be your hope. Heavenly things. Okay, when you see this world falling apart and you hear news, you know, I just, like the other day, there was another big tornado thing hit Michigan and like a hundred homes are destroyed. You know, and it's like, oh boy, that's yeah, really bad. Yeah, but it's it's leading to this time that the Bible prophesied is going to happen. And we should, when we see this negative stuff happening, we should think we're one step closer now to Jesus Christ coming back. And just think for a second. I'll give you something to think about this week. What is going to happen when we are raptured? When that change happens? Do you realize how positive a thing it's going to be? Right now, you know, I, I have back problems from working and logging and stuff like that. And it usually doesn't bother me, but when I stand for a long time, it starts to kind of act up. You know, we can hear my throat's a little bit scratchy. You know, I had a real bad headache for the last couple of days, uh, off and on and, and things. Do you realize when we are changed, this body right now, this vile body like we just read about, is going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? It's going to go from corruptible, from having those pains, to all of a sudden being incorruptible. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in a body that feels no pain? Never a sore throat again. Never a headache. Never a fever. Never back pain. Never all oh, my legs are getting sore. Like that. Boom. Incorruptible body. And here's another one. How about vile body? How about this vile body that struggles with sin? Struggles with thoughts that you shouldn't be thinking. Struggles with covetousness. Struggles with whatever. And all of a sudden, boom. You are now converted to a glorified being that thinks like Jesus Christ thinks. Isn't that amazing? In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. Just like that. Boom. Why wouldn't you want that? Isn't that interesting? These modern Christians that claim to love Jesus, and you talk to them about the rapture, oh, I don't want to, no, no. <laughs> Uh, excuse me? And how about actually getting up there and looking around you and saying, I'm glorified, I don't feel pain anymore, I have no lust in me, no desire to sin. And look over there. There's Sam Jones. There's D.L. Moody. Hey, there's Paul. 
wow, isn't that something? You know, I'm going to get to see my grandparents again. And other Christians, you know, great-grandparents and, you know, going back through and stuff, those that were saved, I'll see Christians down through the centuries. I'll see martyrs. I'll see all these people. And then Jesus Christ. Right now, I believe in him. But I don't know what he looks like. I've never seen him in person. But I will then. You know, our conversation needs to be in heaven. That's what we need to think about. Why? Because in heaven, things don't change. You're not going to get up there to heaven and, oh boy, those streets of gold sure are looking kind of rough, you know. Yeah, well, you know, heaven's falling apart. Uh uh. <laughs> the second law of thermodynamics does not apply to heaven, it only applies to this earth. So why would your conversation be focused here on this earth? It should be in heaven. And when you get around Christians that say, no, I don't want to talk about that stuff. I'm not going to argue with them. Hey, you know, I think the Lord's coming back. Nah, don't talk to me about that. Okay, see you around. <laughs> see ya. Boy, the, the chemtrail thing's really getting bad. Boy, the poison in the plastic. Boy, the, 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 don't talk to me about it. I think things are getting better. All right, see ya. <laughs> don't have time for you. You know, I get all these comments, you know, on these videos that I put out there and stuff. You know, oh, you're negative. You're pessimistic you're you know doom and gloom prophet of doom and gloom and all this stuff what's their problem their conversation is not in heaven they're not looking for jesus christ you know we should be looking for the soon return of jesus christ it's going to be a glorious event in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we will be changed so are you sure it's going to happen yep because the bible says so the biblical law of change so that's a thought to leave you with for this week. Things are going to change for the worse, but eventually things are going to change for us, for us who are saved, things are going to change for the better. And it's going to be very quick and very sudden and very glorious. So let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as I usually pray when we close up here, I thank you so much for your word. I know what a great price, Lord, was paid so that we could have this book in front of us. I think of the martyrs. Uh, I was very unaware of those for of their sacrifice for many years. And it was only just not even 10 years ago that I found out about the horrible sacrifice that Christians had to pay to fight so that we could have the word of God in our own language so that we could understand it. And I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that we're not left in the dark down here. And uh, I, I just pray, Lord, that in your timing, I realize that if the rapture would have already happened, that, that uh, the young sister that just got saved, I realize she wouldn't have made it. She would have had to go into the time of your judgment and your wrath. And Lord, I, I realize that we're still here, Lord, because there are others that are not saved yet. Uh, your long-suffering, Lord. I, I, again, I don't understand. Your word says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. I can't imagine what it would be like to see everything that's going on behind closed doors in this world and not just destroy this planet. Your love is just something we can't even fathom. And obviously, Lord, there's still some people that need to be saved. Still some people that uh, you're keeping the doors open yet. But I pray, Lord, that when that time is finished, and I pray it happens soon, Lord, I pray you give us all wisdom as to how to witness and who to witness to so that we could hasten this day when we would get to see you for the very first time and that we would be changed, as your word says, into an incorruptible being. And so, Lord, I, I just pray that we would all take those opportunities to put out tracks and to witness to the lost and to, to stand strong and to keep our eyes focused on uh, the things in heaven that we are promised. And I just uh, pray too, Lord, that, that uh, we wouldn't get caught up looking at the evil of this world and get too discouraged, Lord. I know it can be, but I pray that we would keep our eyes focused mainly on, on you. And so I just ask all these things this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. 
You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.